So good morning, uh, Tony Danker. Uh, a, f- a very warm welcome to Cornwall. Um, the last time you were here, um, we had a most enjoyable get together, and that was well before social distancing. So we had a really good chat about uh, be the business. And then I was delighted to meet you again at the uh, British Chambers of Commerce Chief Executive Roundtable in December in London um, for a very inspiring uh, presentation about what Be The Business does, what it can do for businesses across the UK, how it's delivering one of the government's primary objectives, uh, productivity. And uh, obviously, since then, circumstances have changed enormously. And I was delighted to see the topic of this morning's talk being from crisis to recovery what will matter for SME businesses in the months uh, and, and as I say possibly in Cornwall's uh, hospitality case the years ahead um, so I think there's uh, absolutely fascinating I think, I think you know as we've got I think nearly 40 participants it will be it's indicative um, that this is a really central issue uh, to Cornwall where we have slightly more than the national average of uh, micro businesses and sole traders Um, And we have uh, slightly more than the national average in um, uh, service industries. And we have 17% less than the national average average wage. So there's lots of anomalies about uh, Cornwall. And I think um, your insight when we met uh, on the previous occasion was was invaluable. So thank you very much for uh, virtually coming to Cornwall. We hope to get you here sometime when things are a bit more normal and look, looking forward very much to what you've got to say this morning and I'll uh, coordinate some Q&As uh, afterwards, Tony. So floor is yours. Thanks very much indeed. Super. Well, thanks, Kim. And it's always a pleasure to work with uh, the wonderful chamber in Cornwall. And uh, I like to feel like I'm in Cornwall. So I've spent a lot of the last two years. One of the very first things we did at Be The Business when we were set up at the end of 2017 is launch our first pilot in Cornwall. And so I spent much of the last two or three years coming to Cornwall uh, really a lot of times per year. And I and I miss it in the last six weeks. I'm due to be there round about now. So I'm in, at least this lets me feel that I'm virtually there. And I'm glad that you've got a son today. We've actually got a son in London too. Uh, but of course, it's not really sunny uplands for the country. So Look, I'm going to say a little bit about Be The Business. I'm going to say a little bit about, look, we've had to change fundamentally what we do in the last six weeks, like everybody. I'm going to talk about where SME businesses are right now. And I'm going to do a little poll with you to find out where you think you are right now. Uh, And then I'm going to talk about the different places and the different strategies for SME businesses with a little bit of sort of lean into what might the future look like. Uh, I'm not from the government, so I can't answer the question you all want to know, which is what happens to furlough and when does lockdown I can answer those questions, but I can think about how firms are approaching this kind of environment. So if we go to the next slide, uh, Naomi, thank you. Uh, Just to say uh, a little bit uh, about Be The Business. Uh, Some of you will know us if you've worked in the hospitality sector and been part of our program, but we were set up in 2017 to tackle uh, UK productivity and competitiveness. Many of you will know that the UK sort of productivity, economic performance had flatlined after the financial crash. And uh, we were set up by the government and by business leaders to try and build a coalition, a coalition of small businesses, large businesses and government, as well as the whole ecosystem of people that work in this field, like the chamber, the lap and so on. Uh, And our whole objective was to try and build a national movement so that in every place in the country, we could be working on productivity and competitiveness. Uh, And as I just said before, one of the very first things we did was set up a hospitality program with Cornish Hospitality. And the reason for that, by the way, was that there was a lot of focus on uh, productivity. It's a sort of geeky word. It's a word for manufacturing. And we wanted to show that no productivity and performance is as true in the hospitality sector, the a construction sector, the social care sector, the financial services sector, as it is in every sector of the economy. And we wanted to come to Cornwall because Cornwall was a low productivity part of the United Kingdom, but obviously an incredibly uh, totemic and much loved part of the United Kingdom. Uh, and so we've been working in Cornwall for the last couple of years. So that's what Be The Business does. And the truth is, before we move on to the next slide, in the last six weeks, we've had to pivot what we do. So it's not about productivity and competitiveness and growth. It's about rescue. It's about recovery. And then it's moving back to renewal and growth going forward. So for the last six weeks, 
we have been working with thousands and thousands of firms, engaging with them about the challenges, helping them get access to help. And, and actually it moved quickly beyond people wanting to know, well, listen, are you getting furloughed? How do you deal with the furlough? How do I get the loan or the grant? And a lot of business owners move, they dealt with that pretty quickly. What they then moved on to is they wanted to know what strategies their peers were following. So if you run a hotel, have you shut your hotel totally? Okay, great. If you've shut your hotel, how are you thinking about reopening? They wanted to have peer-to-peer -peer dialogue about what was going on. And that's where Be The Business are pretty good. And that's what we've been doing a lot of in the last six weeks. So we've talked to a lot of firms about how they're approaching the strategies ahead. And it became clear to us pretty quickly that people were in very different places. Businesses are in very different places. It's not a blanket everybody's shut down, everybody's furloughed, uh, everybody's struggling. It's a bit more textured than that. And so we did quite a lot of interviews with these businesses and we put a poll out in the field. Uh, and Nemi, if we can bring up the next slide. Uh, what we saw, and don't worry about the lines you can't read on the pink bars, but if you look at the right, we basically have seen four main segments of where firms are. Uh, the biggest one is surviving. Uh, and if you're surviving, you're, you've stayed open, you could have a big reduction in demand. You know, you could be operating off, you know, you're probably operating at 20% of what you normally do, but it's the same business. You just haven't got a lot of demand, but you're doing what you can. Second group, hibernating. Now, hibernating is pretty obvious. It does what you think it does. It means you pretty much shut down. And that's either by necessity, you know, you run pubs or restaurants and they're just all closed. Or it's by choice. Uh, maybe you had some cash in the bank and you thought, I'm just going to weather this out and then I'll come back when life's a bit normal. So hibernating, a very large category. There was a, a small category I'm not going to talk about today, which is carrying on, which for some reason or another, nothing really changed. There was then a category, 21% of people who were pivoting the business. They just changed what they were doing. You know, you might be a pub and no one's coming to your pub, so you've decided you're going to deliver meals. Uh, and you've, you've tried to seize the opportunity and move the business in a different direction. And then there's a small group, 6% of people who are thriving. You're possibly a provider to the NHS. Uh, maybe if you're a hospitality business, you're providing hotel rooms to NHS staff, or you make PPE. Or, you know, I was joking with uh, my family the other day, we've been trying to buy a table tennis table uh, to have in the garden so that the boys can play table tennis for the next few months. Of course, there aren't any table tennis tables left in the whole of Britain. Uh, you have to wait till the end of May to get a table tennis table. So there are some businesses who are thriving. And so, Naomi, if we go to the poll, what I'd really love to do is uh, I'd love everybody on the call uh, to try and place ourselves in one of these segments. They might not be perfect, but if you want to just vote, uh, which statement do you relate to currently? Are you hibernating? You pretty much shut down uh, and you're waiting to what happens when the bounce back comes. Secondly, are you fighting through, just doing whatever kind of business you can? Thirdly, are you pivoting to new markets? Are you trying something very different? Or fourthly, you know, are you incredibly busy? Are you just for some reason or another, you're just uh, having an incredibly sort of thriving kind of period. Uh, and as we look at the results as they're emerging, we've got about sort of 20 votes in. Uh, there's a bit of a split, uh, not as many hibernators as I would have thought. Uh, I would have thought the hospitality sector is certainly feeling quite a lot of hibernating, quite a lot of people fighting through, a lot of survivors. Uh, and some of you are pivoting and some of you are incredibly busy. So, yeah, I mean, I think that validates this idea that people are in quite different places. Now, obviously, you know, if you're like most businesses, you've probably gone through all four of these uh, at one point. It's been very uh, it's been very transitionary. Uh, people can be one one week and another ne the next. Let's say a little bit more about those segments. So if we end the poll now, thanks very much for voting. And I hope the segments were useful. I want to talk a little bit more about those segments so that we can understand where people are. So, Nemi, if we go to the next slide, uh, let me talk first of all about hibernators. Uh, this is a guy, Richard Marshall. Uh, he runs he runs a barbering business, really sort of boutique barbers. He's got uh, lots in uh, the UK, mostly in London and one in New York. Uh, and just before the crisis hit, they were booming, absolutely booming. And he just took a decision straight away just to shut everything down. 
he could have tried to keep going, but it was so obvious that, uh, you know, the level of demand was going to be so low and it was just going to be unsustainable. So he took a very quick decision to hibernate. And uh, and Richard, when I asked Richard, you know, what's he doing these days? He basically said on day one, he took the big decision, the painful decision to hibernate. And ever since then, he's been working on his jack in the box strategy. And his jack in the box strategy is the minute he can get going, is he ready? And by the way, is he ready means not just has he got, you know, appropriate social distancing based haircutting techniques. It's about actually, has he got a better online booking system? Uh, has he got a marketing strategy that's ready to go? He's using the downtime well because he knows that normality comes back. Uh, and can he use the downtime well? Someone's just asked, by the way, if the slides will be available afterwards. Yes, they will. So don't worry about rapidly taking notes. Naomi, let's go to the next slide. That's the hibernators. Survivors. Uh, this is Sam, CEO of Astoria. They're an events business. And as you can imagine, events business is not a great business to be in when there's lockdown. Now, they have managed to sustain some online, some of their online event business, so they are continuing to operate. Uh, but look, I think survivors, very. I think if you're in professional services, if you're in any kind of B2B business, uh, probably you know there's a bit of work around. If you're a PR firm or a local accountant or a law firm, uh, you know there's still some work around, and so you don't really want to shut down, but it's just not seeing the levels of demand that you were on. Let's go to the next one, uh, Naomi, to the uh, pivoters. Uh, this is Tom and uh, Hannah from Dunster's Farm uh, in Lancashire in the Northwest. Uh, and they're a really interesting business, a food service uh, business. Uh, they basically supply food to schools and restaurants. Uh, and they 95% of their business went overnight the minute the schools closed. Uh, and they moved immediately to doing home delivery boxes. I'm sure there's lots of you are, are getting this opportunity in, in Cornwall. I know Cornwall have been doing this for a while. But Tom and Hannah had been talking for years about doing home delivery because it's a natural pivot, a natural product extension if you already do food service. Uh, and then all of a sudden, literally within three days, they'd spun up a website. They started doing business. And they're doing probably 10% of the last year's turnover they're doing already in five weeks' time from home delivery. By the way, pretty interesting for Tom and Hannah. We'll come back to this. What happens when the schools come back? Do they forget the home delivery business and just get back to the schools where the big money is? Or do they try and do both? We'll talk about that in a moment. Let's go to the next and the final uh, segment. Uh, I think we have some of these on the call. Uh, so, you know, the, here's, uh, here's Martin Port. Big Change is a mobile resource management company, which, as you can imagine, because they're already mobile, because they're already digital, because they're already an established digital brand, they've thrived. Uh, people that in any way supply the NHS have thrived. And so there are some thrivers out there who are coping with actually very, very high levels of demand uh, and sometimes struggling to cope with demand. Now, some of you will be thinking I should have that problem. But uh, being a thriver is obviously better than the other segments right now, but it also brings with it its own challenges. Uh, let's uh, switch to the next slide. Uh, so look, uh, I, I, I say all of that because I think it's important to, you know, when we talk to government, for example, and they say, well, you know, we have to think about sector A or sector B or part of the country A and part of the country B. And we say that's not really the way to think about it. The way to think about it is to think about how firms and businesses are in a very different place. And by the way, one of the things we haven't talked about, which I'm sure is going through your mind if you run a business, is very often your destiny, frankly, on the face of it, has been completely predetermined and it's got nothing to do with your strategy. So either you are in a sector that's been hit by the lockdown uh, or your cash position. I, I sometimes say it's been a bit like a game of musical chairs where the music stopped on March the 10th or whatever it was. And some firms had quite a lot of cash in the bank. They may have been saving to invest. Uh, other firms could have very little cash in the bank. They may have just bought a brand new tech system or they may have just uh, you know, bought new premises or signed a new lease. Uh, and so like musical chairs, the music stopped and you were left in a position that was predetermined. But I think that a lot of the segments we are seeing are people taking their destiny into their own hands and where they can to try and either innovate for free because there's not a lot of ability to borrow to invest right now or to uh, 
basically try and capitalize on their position for one reason or another. If you're a hibernator, don't sit at home worrying about the business dying away. Try and take action for the bounce back. Let me say a little bit about the way we think about recovery, and then I'm going to uh, stop uh, talking and I'm going to uh, get into debate. Uh, look, I, I think there are four themes emerging. One is firms are challenging their own orthodoxy about their operating models. That's a lot of business speak. What does it really mean? Firms are thinking about what they do and they're thinking about have they got the right business model? Uh, a lot of firms thinking about whether or not their business model is diversified enough. Uh, a lot of firms thinking about pivoting opportunities, innovation opportunities. And one of the themes of the recovery, I think, is going to be if you've been pivoting and changing now, can you sustain these new exciting products and services that you've come up with in the last five or six weeks? Uh, and frankly, how do you sustain now two or three different diversified parts of your business or product or service or offer? And in particular, if you've had a bit of success, if you've been like Tom at Dunster's Farm and you've really got this home delivery business going, do you keep that going when schools reopen? Uh, and if so, then you're probably going to want to borrow, to invest in that new business, and is now a time to really borrow? So that's a really hard one, but I think there's a big opportunity for pivoting. There's a big opportunity to get behind the ideas you've come up with and the opportunities you've seen. Uh, but will we really see people backing those ideas or will they retreat? Will they retreat because there's just not enough cash or attention around and there's enough to do to get the old business back? Secondly, technology. I mean, here we are uh, all operating on this system. Uh, you know, I was speaking to the head of Accenture last week, the uh, technology consultancy, and they had previously done a report saying that these kinds of business technologies, remote working, online collaboration tools, uh, you wouldn't get peak usage until 2035. Well, that changed in about three days. Uh, there's a famous Lenin quote, which is that uh, nothing happens for decades. And then sometimes decades happen in a week. And that's what's happened with online technology, right? We are all now comfortably working in webinars. I mean, I can see that some of you are having connectivity problems, but the truth is we've all got really good at this really quickly. Now, that's great. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, technology opportunity and people working from home in the long run. I think the really interesting technology story is this. Britain for a long time now has been behind on technology adoption compared to other countries in Europe. CRM systems and ERP systems and cloud-based HR and, and finance systems. We're really behind on those. We're something like 20th in Europe. I think we're 28th or 38th in the world for ICT adoption. We're just not very techy, actually. And one of the reasons, and we learned this a lot from talking to Cornish businesses and other businesses, is uh, very often that leaders of businesses don't have the confidence or the skills in technology systems to embed them as a core way of working. Well, we've just now embedded this as a core way of working. Could that lead to us moving on to the next set of technologies? Uh, talking to a playground manufacturer in the Northwest, he was telling me that, you know, one of his biggest challenges is that, fine, everyone's going to come back off furlough, but his sales pipelines totally died. And he hasn't had uh, salespeople in the office with the files and the Rolodex is making calls. And of course, he's realized that what he also needed was a CRM system. He needed to be able to make sales calls from home, to have customer communications from home. And so will we now see a significant adoption of technology, given that everyone's realized what it can do? Thirdly, uh, there is real focus on preparing for more shocks to come. Resilience. You'll have heard that word resilience. I'll be amazed if you haven't been on a webinar about resilience. And resilience is a thing. Because the truth is, I think a lot of businesses feel like the music stopped six weeks ago and they find their business to not be resilient enough. Now, that can be financial resilience, didn't have enough reserves, or they had too many fixed costs. It could be staff resilience, the whole mental health and well-being and the staff connectivity and levels of engagement. It could be operational resilience. You know, they just didn't have the systems and processes that they needed in place. Or it could be diversified revenue model. They weren't diversified enough. And so I think, given that there could be a second wave or a third wave or Brexit, which somebody mentioned, this idea of resilience, is my business really resilient enough, I think is going to be a major focus and question. And then finally, people always ask me, what will COVID-19 do to productivity? You know, we've been serially underperforming in productivity. What's the impact? 
Well, I think it's going to be twofold, a positive and a negative. The positive is that people are going to think about efficiency. From a cash drain position, we're going to have to think about lowering the cost base of how we do business. We just have no alternative. And so you're going to see a lot of people wrestling efficiencies. However, I think you're probably going to see businesses being reluctant to invest because they're because of that cash position. Not sure people are going to be queuing up to take on more bank loans, bank loans for investment and growth. And I say that because I think there's actually quite a lot of innovation opportunities for firms that want to capture them. And we know from history that firms in recessions capture opportunities. But I think this is one for policymakers. How are we going to incentivize and allow firms that want to come out of this ambitiously and get behind new products and new ways of doing business that they've got the ability to do so? So I'm now finished. Uh, and Kim, I'm going to hand back to you. I'm going to put my microphone on mute so that we can get a few questions or comments in and then I'll uh, respond to them when we've got a few in and you direct me. So I'm hoping that click was near me unmuting me because uh, mine still isn't working. Yep, okay, we're, we're on, good. Thank you very much indeed, excellent. And uh, I see you've already answered the question of whether the slides will be available because they are uh, a good reminder for people to have. Um, and one of the things that I've been talking about is how to use this time that perhaps you're saving on not commuting or uh, not traveling to meetings or that sort of thing, to think about just what you were talking about there, making sure your business is fit for the future. And we are definitely going to see some massive changes. Uh, for those businesses that, that can survive this, which I hope with everybody in this room and, and everybody else uh, that we get this webinar to, there will be new ways of doing things. And we've been saying on a couple of uh, occasions that that sort of acceptability of remote working will definitely uh, accelerate Cornwall's um, acceptability as a place to do B2B business, you know. Um, obviously, it's long been, it's long been the, uh, uh, the place to run uh, on holiday and, the, and, and all of the businesses which support that leisure industry have been uh, very well honed here to make sure that they can cope with the four and a half million people that, that come here every year. But I think in terms of B2B, we've still been a bit of a hangover from the 20th century, you know, considered remote from marketplaces and our people a long way from where the action happens. And I think that this will accelerate uh, the acceptability of working uh, remotely. So people need to use this time to make sure that, uh, as you were saying, that their business model um, really is fit for the future. And I think it's this sort of um, thought-provoking set of slides here that you can really um, uh, aid that. So I, th I suppose the first thing I'd like to sort of ask you is whether there are, in your many circles that you're moving in, top tips for what people should be best using their time for now or using their using their wilder thoughts for. So let, where, where, where should their thoughts run to when you're not sort of constrained by meetings and so on so much? You've got time to walk the dog or go for a jog or whatever it might be. What are the directions of thought that could put, that, that would be best for Cornwall going forward, but obviously therefore by extension the UK catching up in, in this, you know, woeful position in the, in the techie league table that you referred to? Yeah. Well, look, I think it's a great uh, question, Kim. And by the way, this remote working thing and the B2B opportunity, uh, that was totally validated for me yesterday. I was speaking to uh, the country manager for a world famous technology uh, that many businesses use. Uh, and he was saying to me that, you know, they had recognized that a big opportunity in this crisis is to have, you know, is the inshoring opportunity is to have talent pools around the country outside the Southeast uh, as a vital part of their business. Uh, and so I think what you described, you know, the great promise of that, that we always thought was true, I think that is going to accelerate now. And so I think in terms of from the sort of demand side, if you might be able to provide those services, uh, I think there are going to be uh, a lot of companies uh, recognizing now that uh, their employees and their services can be spread around the United Kingdom. And I think that is an opportunity for Cornwall. I also think uh, 
It's very interesting. I have a, we, you know, our office is in London, even though we've got people spread around the country and we've got quite a lot of young people work in the office. And the other thing that I think that's going to happen, that we had a, a, a glass of wine on Zoom the other night and discussed this, is that young people aren't going to put up with London rates of uh, employ, you know, London London costs of living or central Manchester costs of living or maybe Bristol, downtown Bristol costs of living. Uh, and they will, I think, see the opportunity to have a sort of better life living in more, uh, in better places to live and be able to work remotely. So I think it's a real opportunity. I, I can't see exactly how it's going to map out. All I can tell you is that actually, uh, Big companies in London and the Southeast are talking about it now as a major point of opportunity. And so I think if you're a Cornwall business, being ready to be on the receiving end of that uh, is a good thing. And that leads me, uh, Kim, to your next question around advice, uh, around what, what could we be doing now? And I think there's two things. One is the tech piece. Uh, technology gives you resilience. Uh, it can also drive efficiency. Uh, it's hard to get your skin on, it's hard to get underneath it to work on how you can really implement it successfully in your business. We've actually just launched, uh, and Annie, I just wonder if you could put into the chat the new Be The Business Tech Tool. Uh, Tom can send you the link, Be The Business uh, slash tools. And we've just launched a pro platform exactly for businesses like you who wanna get smart on technologies. There's quite a steep learning curve. How can we get you up the learning curve quickly? I would say get your get your business tech in good tech shape now. Uh, a because it's going to help you with efficiency, and B because it's going to allow you to access the things you just described, Kim. And then I think secondly, in terms of the innovation wave that comes, every recession when you study it, there is business failure, significant business failure. But there's always some innovators who come out of the recession stronger because they innovated to capture the opportunity. So I would say think hard about what your opportunity is. What is it about your business that's suitable for these times? What is it about your business or what you could be doing that actually responds directly to the emerging change in world or what everyone's calling the new normal? Uh, so I think those two things. One, think about tech, tech, you know, basically really now using tech in your business and Annie's put on the link in the chat. And then secondly, just think about your proposition. If the world's going to be looking for more Cornish businesses or if the world's going to be looking for different kinds of products and services, move now. Now's a good time to move. Thank you. Excellent, excellent and very encouraging if you can start here. Now, there, there are a few questions, Tony, on the sure. chat room there, starting with Jackie Swain and moving down through three or four there. Jackie uh, is... Um, the director of a commercial estates group in Cornwall and uh, chair of the Cornwall Chamber of Commerce. So if we start with Jackie, then go down through Dan and uh, Ruth and, and Laurie, Adam and so on. Just work through those if you if you're happy to do that, Tony. Yeah, so I will do that. I'll just do I'll just pick up on that. Jackie, are we content with broadband provision in Cornwall if we're to spend more time using online collaboration? Uh, so. Uh, well, look, Jackie, I'm just not really an expert on on broadband connection. Absolutely right. I mean, uh, you know, there's a huge broadband dependency, and I know that uh, I know that BT. Look, you guys know this stuff better. I know BT and, uh, tried to advance things in Cornwall. I'm sure they're not going to need to be, uh, but I think this is a good time for a bit of Cornish lobbying on broadband. If that's what you need, we can help you with some of the big providers because, yeah, you're right. I, I think you need strong broadband connection to be able to access these opportunities. So I think it's completely right, and, and I'll allow you, you Cornish uh, natives to debate whether or not it's good enough. Uh, but it, it has to be right. It's a precondition. And then looking at Dan, is part of the answer to localize and shorten supply chains? Can that be done without becoming inward looking? Yeah. This is Dan, that's true on an international level as well as a sort of, you know, Cornish rest of UK level, isn't it? That is sort of the question. I mean, I, 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 I'm quite optimistic about localized supply chain. Uh, I mean, I think it was becoming an issue with Brexit anyway. And I think it doubles down as an issue in this regard. Uh, and yeah, it might be inward looking and parochial, but I think it's, it's an opportunity to boost local supply chains because local supply chains add to your resilience. They can also work against that. Sometimes, you know, global manufacturers like to distribute their supply chain in order to have, you know, hedged value, right, to have greater resilience. 
But I think, you know, if you're uh, if you're a Cornish hotelier or if you're a Cornish manufacturer, uh, as localized a supply chain as possible is gives you more resilience. I don't know how quite to advance that agenda, but I think you're right. And I think that if you are somebody who is potentially a member of a supply chain, I'd be making this case because I think I'd be making it under the power of resilience. Uh, I'm going to keep going down. Uh, smart towns and villages, says Ruth, although I'm not sure she's asking a question. She's responding to some of the debate. Uh, looking at Laurie, uh, a sector-based approach to unlocking. Do you think there's an opportunity to lobby for a phased opening up based on geography, or is that too complex? Look, again, this isn't my field of expertise, and some of the business lobbying organizations will be better. Adam, who runs the British Chambers of Commerce, who uh, Kim and I know very well, will probably have a better view on this than me. I know that the mayors of the big cities are very worried about uh, a, a geographical approach. Uh, and of course, you know, if you're trying to gain this as a local area, you might say, well, actually, you know, we should go first because we've got low COVID-19 impact. But then, you know, the Londoners might say, yeah, well, it's coming your way. I, I, I think the geography thing, it's not even that it's complex. You could argue it's really simple. Uh, I just think that it actually... I don't think it helps. I think I think you're trying to second guess virus spread. Uh, and I think it will create a lot of political division in the country. And so my instinct is they'll work away from that. Uh, but we shall see. Uh, uh, Adam, Adam is hoping that young professionals uh, look to move to Cornwall from uh, city centers. And I, I think that's right. I mean, that's a trend you guys know has already been happening. Uh, and Dan's come another question there. I can appreciate how this video conferencing tech supports innovation, but I think the costs haven't yet been fully appreciated in terms of mental well-being. Not wholly convinced that's an answer to isolation. Maybe it intensifies it. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, the only thing I'll say is we've been learning a lot. I don't know about you all. We've really been learning a lot about how to use these kinds of tools for social connectivity and mental health. Uh, you know, we've got uh, this evening, we've got an online quiz for all our employees and we've been trying to do glasses of wine we've been we've been trying to replicate the water cooler at work and what's really interesting uh, there's a guy uh, you'll hate this guy but there's a guy called matt carr who runs something called cars pasties in bolton you'll obviously resent the fact that bolton's making pasties uh, but matt's got a lot of staff from real relatively poor and deprived areas and he he furloughed the entire business straight away 100 people uh, and he became really quite conscious about how for a lot of his staff that lived in difficult estates and so on, uh, work was such an important part of their lives. It was a community. It was a framework. It, it was a place to be at their best. It was a relief from home sometimes. And if people have got difficult home situations, that's true. And I think he's really recognized the mental health problem you raised, Dan. In fact, he actually paid for a mental health consultancy to work with all his employees directly, because what he was worried about was that everybody would call, if he was to call everyone up and say, hey, how are you doing? They'd all go, yeah, fine, fine, fine. They didn't want to admit to him that they were struggling. Uh, and so he's got an independent firm to help them through some of their struggles. Now, if you can afford to do that, what an amazing thing to do. Uh, but I, yeah, I think these mental health issues are real. Uh, and sometimes you can get complacent about them. So you can be on a Zoom call and everybody looks happy and you can say, hey, Steve, how are you? And hey, Frank, how are you? And everybody seems fine, but they're not really. As a leader of a bit, you know, I, I lead a team of about 45 people and I've tried to do one-to-one -one outreach. Uh, and sometimes I'm not the right guy because I'm the boss. And so we've had some people in our HR team do one-to-one -one outreach. The only thing I'd say about this is you just can't be complacent about it. Every week you have to think about it because... The minute you think you're on it as a business leader, and actually I've been in touch with all my staff, I've done a really great job of sharing, and we've all had a chance to talk. You know what? Two weeks later, it can change. There was some research out last week from King's College and, and Ipsos Mori, uh, and it basically tried to segment how people, the, not workforces, the entire country is responding to lockdown. 44% accepting, 48% uh, suffering, uh, nine percent just resisting uh, and the sufferers you know it, it goes in waves right we all know this some some days we have great days other days we have really terrible days so I think it's right Dan we're all going to have to get smart about understanding mental health and trying to tackle it uh, in a socially distanced way which sounds impossible but I'm confident we'll work it out uh, 
just seeing if anything else, the cost of digital working tools, uh, Adam, in response to Dan, uh, what's frustrating is trying to get the training out to Cornish SMEs. Yeah, look, I think that, uh, look, at the, the one thing I'll say about technology, because we're really getting under the skin about technology is, I sometimes say to SME owners, and very often SME owners are, you know, in their 40s, 50s, 60s and above, uh, our computers now drive our cars. And anyone that's driving a car with a fancy computer, we've all had to learn the computer in order to be able to learn how to drive our car. I think the same is true of our businesses. We now need to recognize that computers can drive our businesses. I don't mean, you know, your, your laptop. I mean computer systems. And so I really encourage everybody, whether or not it's using training for, there's nothing better than having a face-to-face -face advisor, using the platform I've just shared. There's sort of no excuse now. If you're running a business and you don't understand what a CRM system is and whether it can help you, now's the time to learn. Uh, I'm just having a look at some of the other questions, uh, Kim, but tell me to shut up if you, if you think that I'm uh, going uh, a bit far. Cost of living issues for those getting city wages working remotely. Uh, yeah, I can see that. I can see those issues uh, that Rachel raises. I don't know the answers, but I, I totally see them, Rachel. Uh, Ruth is saying the mental well-being point, interesting, important, plays into the productivity question. Uh, yeah, you manage the human as well as the technical side of the changes. But, I mean, Ruth, you're completely right. By the way, all the shortcomings in technology adoption have been because people didn't buy into them. So tech systems only work if people buy into them, if they understand them and they use them in their daily lives. One of the things you'll see if you go on our platform is all the tech success stories were because the staff basically demanded the technology, not that the technology was thrust upon them. And the human side of business, I mean, we've been talking about employee engagement for a long time. One of our biggest programs is called Productivity Through People. And it's that fundamental belief that actually leveraging your human capital and getting more from them, I don't mean more ours, I mean better answers, is the best way to run your business. Uh, going in. Yeah, Kim, come in. Yeah, yeah, it was that producti productivity through people presentation that you made at, uh, in December, which I was really struck by because you look at some of the businesses that we've got on this webinar now who are definitely people driven where the, the people will be the highest cost to the business by far and I think we've felt certainly I felt in Cornwall for a long time that what you referred to at the beginning though that, that productivity and value of widgets produced per hour just doesn't do it for us here and I would like to see some academic research around uh, what I consider more service industry and more um, Cornish type of industry uh, measurement, um, probably some academic measurement from universities around, around things like well-being in the workplace, lifetime productivity, low staff turnover, which I think are really important uh, aspects of people's ability to um, uh, be productive year in, year out, which I just don't think present measures take account of. And I think it was that um, productivity through people, which really began to show that there is some thinking, you know, some academic thinking around that sort of thing. So I think I did get some of the slides out, which you, you very kindly made available after that talk. But uh, perhaps after this, you and Annie could get some of those out to us again, just to remind people so they can use their uh, spare time at the moment to look around thinking how the, the, their people, their team can really um, be most effective. I think that's a message so so important for us here yeah i think that's good kim i uh i mean i agree and we've got that research and we can share it with you uh what's really interesting is our productivity through people program was uh created and designed with universities by bae systems and rolls royce uh because i mean you could not get more capital intensive industries than you know submarine makers and uh and plane engine makers uh but they had realized that the competitive advantage came from people uh, because you have, you know, even if you're in a manufacturing business, you know, you, you, you make your big fixed cost investments. You, and the difference is not really in the machine. The machine does what the machine does. It's whether or not your people can work in ways that extract its value and deliver new value. You're totally right about the service industries. I mean, I, I'm better equipped to understand Cornish hospitality than other Cornish service industries. One of the most popular 
uh, masterclasses that we ran in Cornwall in the last two years uh, was when we brought the uh, COO of the Pig Hotel Group. Some of you will know that the hoteliers on the call will definitely know the Pig Hotel Group. Boutique Hotel, I think it started in Hampshire. Uh, and they have now got five or six and they're growing frantically well, sort of boutique hotel, but becoming a chain of boutiques. And everybody sort of, uh, I think we did it at the Watergate Bay and there was a big crowd. And uh, actually all he talked about, Tom, the, the COO, was people, managing people. And the secret of the pig hotel was, was the people. And it was about the investment that they made in the staff, about the staff being enabled and empowered to deliver service to the customer rather than a certain function in their role. Uh, and that the training investment had had huge, uh, huge ROI. And that actually building multifunctional staff who could operate across the hotel made for rewarding careers. And I think people were sort of surprised that on the face of it, you know, they were assuming there was some business magic or it was a financial story, but it was a people training story. And uh, you guys in the hospitality sector or you guys in any kind of seasonal service industry know that that's quite hard when you've got a lot of seasonal uh, labor. Uh, the truth about investing in people and investing in skill building and investing in service training, for example, I mean, it's not rocket science as an idea. It's incredibly intuitive and obvious. Uh, but executing it well and consistently well and executing it with the same discipline that you basically apply to, you know, counting your takings at the end of the week. That's the trick. That's what the successful firms do. Incidentally, one of the many, many reasons we hope for a, a quick end to this crisis is that the uh, pig at Harlin Bay in North Cornwall was due to open and then had to shut down before it even uh, managed to get its doors open because of this crisis. That's one of the many places that I think there's a huge pent up demand uh, and desire to go and uh, uh, partake of their services, to be honest. So, um, yeah, we look forward to that amongst many other uh, reasons. Okay, any other? Um... I see, Jill is talking a lot about training within Cornwall, uh, and I'm sure that's right. Uh, look, I think, you know, one of my observations from working in Cornwall has been. Uh, what, what, I'm sure there's a maxim, Kim, you'll correct me on it. You know, everyone's always far away. Uh, and sometimes ha that half hour can be, feel like far too far. And sometimes it can feel like eminently doable. But I, you know, what you really want to get going in Cornwall, and Kim, you'll be working on this, is that real sense of a cluster. A real sense of businesses, even competitors. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a fancy phrase called co-opetition, which is collaboration between competitors. Uh, you really want to build clusters and, and you know, it might be uh, Truro Penwith College, it might be the Chamber, whatever the institutions are, how can you build a cluster of successful innovation and firm sharing, competing and sharing from each other? Uh, and I think that's really important to Cornwall's future success because I remember talking to Malcolm Bell about the Cornish hospitality sector and Cornwall at that at that time was being consistently voted, I think it was nine years as a row, as the sort of British tourist destination on, of choice. And what would it take to make that true going forward? And the realization that there's only so much trade promotion and marketing promotion to Germany and the US and Japan, et cetera, can achieve that actually having really effective, innovative businesses uh, was what was going to drive Cornwall's future destination. Uh, Cornwall is a future destination. And the way to do that was to have this co-opetition, was to have businesses that are learning, even borrowing and pinching from each other. Some of the outside in stuff, you know, is, is the pig coming into Cornwall a good thing or a bad thing? I would say to you straight away, it's a good thing because they'll bring in new innovations, new ways of doing service. And, and in a successful cluster, everybody will copy that straight away. And that goes to your other service industries. Uh, and so, you know, look outwards and bring inwards and use them as a sort of injections of competitive, but also uh, cooperative opportunities to build Cornwall's sort of collective success. Uh, it's easy, very easy to say, hard to do, but I know, Kim, that's exactly what you at the Chamber do. We do try and create those clusters, though, and Malcolm Bell does a fantastic job with the tourism sector. And of course, you know, with tourism and hospitality across the world, and no different here in Cornwall, the participants are thousands of micro and small businesses. So it is difficult to get that cooperation. Um, 
growing and people to believe that by doing that, they're going to be better off in the long term. But we, it was beginning to uh, happen. And I think that the current crisis will um, accelerate uh, that. There's, um, there, was, there was a lot of, of criticism that the, um, the EU funding we had in Cornwall for 20 years ignored tourism as a sector, despite the fact that it's always been a massive part of our economy and, of course, is 20% across the whole of the um, mainland Europe, but there are some of their uh, economies as well. So it's, it was stupidly ignored and wrongly ignored, and it's just been put back a couple of years ago onto the agenda. So there already is a bit of a burst around hospitality tech, around improving booking systems and ironing out some of the peaks and troughs of individuals yeah. and of um, peaks and troughs in holiday seasons, that sort of thing. So there was a, a, a desire to make Cornwall all, all year round by promoting culinary breaks and walking breaks and whale watching breaks and that sort of thing. So hopefully that people will learn the lessons um, uh, that we were sort of put in front of us and now absolutely sick to death of during this crisis and use it to uh, iron out some of those peaks and troughs in the future and tech. Uh, and adapt, adapt, adoption of tech has a whole a huge part to play in that. Yeah. Look, I know we're, we're going to run out of time shortly. So if there are any more questions, please put them in the chat. Also reactions. You know, I'd, uh, this is actually the first time I've shared this segmentation in a presentation. Uh, I've just done a LinkedIn post on it today. And so I think if, if you've got any reactions as to whether or not you think the segments work, I, I wonder, Naomi, if we could go back up to uh, – the segments, if we the, the the slide very early on, which had uh, the sort of the four segments on 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 one page, the bar chart slide, uh, I think that would be good uh, just to get people's reactions to it. And I'd love to get people's yeah, this one. I, I just love to get people's. Uh, you can't really see the uh, questions, but you know what they were from the poll. Uh, I'd love to just get a, a sense from people if this works, if that speaks to where you feel you are. Kim, is it worth saying, just whilst we're waiting for some comments and feedback to come in, uh, some of the other big sector opportunities in Cornwall? I'd love to hear a little bit about you know, what's been doing well in Cornwall in the last few years and, and is sort of growing and, and, and you guys are really on in order to thrive in the next five or ten years. That 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 um, dropped in and out. So I only got half of that, Tony. But I think you were asking if everybody can hear me. Um, which which sectors we're looking forward to doing well in the next ten years? Was that what, yeah, what the question was? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, the um, the LEP uh, a couple of years ago consulted uh, at a number of uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, events. We were delighted to be the sort of business uh, connectivity and conduit for that information, and we've come up with nine sectors plus the place itself being uh, of huge uh, value and I think largely the Chamber of Commerce agrees with the sectors uh, that have been agreed. Um, Jackie listening will, will, will say why wasn't construction um, identified. Uh, I think it probably should have been referred to more strongly but of course it's a national problem not particularly a Cormor and ours a silly one but the the opportunities uh, exist, um, and I'm not sure at my age whether I can remember all nine off the top of my head, but um, tourism certainly back on top of the agenda again. Uh, green energy, um, uh, uh, agri-tech, um, creative, um, the niches around space in the, using the spaceport and Goon Hilly, um, uh, marine, uh, and there were, there were two or three others. So we, 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 I think, all have a sort of rough guide of where we're going over the next 10 years. And I, to be honest, I think as a sort of, um, you know, 10, 15, 20 year plan, that's OK, as long as we know what sectors uh, are largely going to uh, flourish. Right. We need to be aware of, you know, things coming up on the rails like computer gaming um, spin outs from Farmworth University, uh, which you could you could put under the nub of, of either creative or uh, or tech, but we just need to make sure we're concentrating on those things correctly. But but largely, I think there is a sort of a loose framework from which we all feel quite encouraged, or we were feeling quite encouraged until this thing came along. And as yeah. and you know, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to say poor old me because um, 
that the new Cornwall is all about being absolutely at the cutting edge and being at the forefront of actions and thought leaders around where a 21st century economy is going to look like. But, you know, it is true that, that 30% of the businesses and 40%, 40% of the, uh, uh, sorry, 30% of the, of the GDP and 40% of the businesses are linked in some way to hospitality and tourism. And that is undoubtedly a setback just at the moment. So we'll... Yeah concentrate on getting through that and see where we go from there so well i think i just think just one thought on that kim i think that's a really great future proof set of industries and i think even if the next couple of years are going to be hard times to access capital to really double down on that creating clusters around those in order to give cornwall a sort of be able to jump the shark as they call it and and be uh, and be in the right strategic position when demand recovers and then hopefully what hospitality will bring is, you know, that sort of real horizontal sector that allows, that just makes it such a great place to live, which I know it is. And before you wrap up, I just want to call out some of the feedback came in. John uh, talked about percentages rather than absolutes in the segments. And John, you are, of course, right. Uh, no segment is perfect. And I think that idea of, you know, being in a majority position in one of the segments is good. And then, David, I really like the idea of a slingshot. I think, you know, uh, Pal Mal Barber used Jack in the Box. Slingshot's another great word. So thank you for that. So, Kim, sorry, you'll probably want to close us off because we're reaching the well, end. Well, I think, I think we'd better. I know, I know there's nothing magical about an hour. And in fact, one of, one of the smart working techniques we heard uh, yesterday was don't automatically schedule meetings for an hour. You know, if they warrant more, fine if they if they are wrapped up in 15 minutes then let them be wrapped up in 15 minutes not everybody has to sit in a room in quite the same way um uh, when, you, when you're online like this but i think we probably um we're, we're, we're some of us guilty in arranging things in hourly chunks and i know that some people will have things at, at 12 o'clock so there's, a, there's other questions we've we've got this uh, line of communication with you, Tony, and with your organisation, which I see as being very helpful to Cornwall. We, we, I know you're passionate about what we're doing here and what we can do over the, the coming years. There was already this levelling out of, or levelling up, which, you know, I think this crisis in many ways will do for Cornwall what the government were already doing for the bloody Northern Powerhouse and the Midlands Engine. Um, maybe this, you know, naturally brings to Cornwall and the Great South West some of that... Um, uh, realization that this is a great place to work and position your your knowledge workers and your um thought pro pro thought provokers for the future so um thank you very much for being part of it thank you for spending the time with us this morning uh, we do hope to see you in cornwall soon and i'll be hoping to share a, a glass of um camel valley or tribute with you either in um in london or in in, in cornwall in the not too distant future i hope to say so Thank you very much indeed for your insight, uh, your slides very carefully put together and, and your time this morning. Thanks, everybody, for coming. All the best. Thanks, Tony. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Cheers, Tony.